first time to, to KAIST this time. Um, I gave a talk with similar, uh, with the same title and abstract last, last week in um, Daegu, and Jack said uh, it's basically disjoint audience, but there are three people here who also were there, so um, I changed the talk a little, so especially you, want, you, you might see today in the end um, how we really construct those graphs that, that are relevant for the uh, for our main result, or for the main result I'm going to present here. Um, maybe one word about, about me. You might be surprised that I'm from Shanghai. One of the reasons is just this um, special institute that exists in that city. Um, it's called CAS MPG. CAS is Chinese Academy of Science. MPG is Max Planck Society, and so they have this common institute, um, and Max Planck Society pays one third of the overall money, and that's why there are several Germans around, and, and I'm one of them. Um, so it's an institute for computational biology, but I am um, the only uh, mathematician there at the moment, and, and I do some um, um, more biology related work, but I still I, I'm allowed at this institute to um, work on some, some mathematics problems too. So anyway, um, I'm going to talk about phylogenetics, and then there's phylogenetic combinatorics. It's actually some um, emerging area within in combinatorics, where there are a few textbooks now and a few more coming. It's about the reconstruction of evolutionary tree. So evolutionary tree, it's biologists call it phylogenetic tree. And so what you really want is um, something like this. Here on the leaves you have some species, say, or some taxonomic units. You want to know how they evolved. From Darwin theory we know that there should be um, one last common ancestor of all of them that is represented by the root of the tree. And then there are some branching processes where one species, like in a speciation event groups, they're uh, separate through some mutation. <coughs> the other processes of Darwinian evolution, and then um, this happens all the time until we finally get the um, species living today. So from this you can, for example, decide that these two taxa here are, are sisters and, and they, they form some um, taxonomic group. So this is really the kind of um, tree that we would like to see. Um, um, but in biology, in, in biological journal, what you often see is something like, like here, that is an unrooted tree, and instead of this, here we do not have any direction. So also, we do know, if you just have this tree, you do not know, do these two belong together, or maybe all the others? Which one is really the group, which one is the, the, just the rest? The reason why we look at this kind of trees is that um, the, the raw data we get for phylogenetic analysis is usually undirected. We get, for example, sequence data and, and then we can compare them. Are they similar? Are they different? But even if you see an ancestral sequence and the sequence of a taxon living today, you can't see which one is new, which one is old. So usually what we get is um, some undirected information and that's why it basically it makes more sense to construct an unrooted tree here. Um, if, you already, if you know where the root comes into this tree, then the, the information is the same. So what people do in practice is they put in some outgroup, meaning some taxon that does not really belong to the group that you are studying, um, but is still related enough to compare it with the others, and then where that taxon comes in, that's where the root should go. Um, one word for the practice here, that outgroup here is both. Somebody, if somebody knows Latin, that is a kettle, while all the others are marsupials, like kangaroos, those um, mammals that, that wear their babies in a bag. And from that you know that this tree is actually misrooted, because where the both comes in, that is where the root should be. Uh, this is just an example of, of um, um, of the object that we are really want that we want to um, reconstruct. One thing you can see here in this um, phylogenetic, in this unrooted phylogenetic tree, the information of this tree is basically by partitions, because like here we have these three taxa, they are grouped together in some sense, 
Um, but either those three form a meaningful group or the complement does. And the information of this comes from this edge. And if you remove this edge, um, the, the, the tree, of course, it becomes disconnected. You get two components. Some taxa are in the one, some are in the other. That is a bipartition. And that's really the information in this tree. Um, so that's what we like to um, see um, in, in those phylogenetic trees. Um, but sometimes trees are not really enough to look at, and then we construct some slightly more complicated networks. Like here, you see on the left side, that is the same tree as before, only with some edge lengths representing the, the uh, genetic difference that was accumulated along the edge. So you see here in the, in the middle, there are some very short edges, and you can imagine that there it's hard to, to um, see from the data which branching pattern is really correct. Maybe this very short edge is really wrong and you should resolve that in, in, in a different way. And, and in such cases, sometimes we draw some network like this, um, which looks like the tree locally, but then there are other areas where th these boxes come in. So uh, why do we look at networks at all and not at trees? There's two reasons for that. First of all, they, they're used to visualize reticulate evolution. That means something happened that does not fit on a tree. Something that has separated at some point comes together later again. That happens sometimes in biology. If there's something like lateral gene transfer or um, hybridization, recombination, then these things happen and, and then there is no correct tree for the whole data. So it's clear that, that um, there must be some signals that do not fit on any tree. And if you still want to, to um, display them in some kind of structure, then you have to generalize the concept of a phylogenetic tree. Another one is that even if you think that there should be a collect tree, it often happens because of noise or because of some other um, events that occur in biology, that there is support for conflicting splits. And again, instead of drawing an unresolved tree with some uh, high degree vertices, sometimes makes sense to um, draw some network instead where you can see conflicting hypotheses within one diagram and then maybe make a further study. So, as I said for the tree, the main information we have is the bipartitions that, that are induced by the edges of the tree. And so if you have a network that works in a very simple, uh, similar way, so every edge in this network is contained in a set of edges of parallel lengths such that when we remove them, we get a um, um, disconnected network with two components. Like here, we take those red edges all away, we get our bipartition. And if you have weights of your bipartition, then um, the length of each of the edges corresponds to some weight. So this is how you get the um, splits and the weights from a given network. And actually, it is possible to draw network for arbitrary split systems like this. So there are some algorithms to do that, maybe with exponential number of vertices, but in, in general, it's possible. Um, so we are interested in collections of splits. That's by partition, the same word, uh, the same thing. This somehow in phylogeny, people used to call to talk about splits. So we are interested in collections of splits. And compatible split systems there uh, correspond to phylogenetic trees. So the first sentence here is what I already said. Um, the second one too. And then finally, there, is, um, there are some special split systems that do um, correspond to phylogenetic trees. They're called compatible. And there is an easy characterization from 1971 already. So a set of splits is compatible if and only if for two given splits, like here into A and B, as well as into C and D, one of the four possible intersections uh, that you get by choosing one from the one split and one set from the other split has to be empty. In the picture below, it's clear that that is a necessary condition, because the graph that we have is a tree. There must be every, both splits correspond to um, uh, one edge, so there must be one well-defined path connecting those two edges. And then, like here, there is AB is left of the red edge and right of the red edge. CD is left of the blue edge and right, whereas this 
the blue edge and of course left of the red edge and right of the blue edge is empty. And it's clear that that always has to happen for a tree whenever you like look at two different edges. So there it's clear it's a necessary condition and it's also not too difficult to show um, that it is sufficient by just using some induction over number of splits. So this is um, kind of nice characterization of, of um, compatible split systems. And now if you want to look at something more general than trees, but not very general um, arbitrary split systems, then what we can do is just relax this condition. I, and that's what is done for weakly compatible split systems. So now it's not a pairwise condition, it's a triplewise condition. Again, we look at the, um, no, now we look at three splits, A1, B1, 2, A3, B3. And again, we have an uh, empty intersection condition. But it's not the, the obvious um, generalization. You, we do not require, um, require that just any of the eight possible intersections, choosing one from each of the three splits, has to be empty. But for, um, if you, if you char start choosing three times A, then one of either this intersection or one of the three possibilities to choose two Bs and one A has to be empty. So it is um, um, slightly more restrictive than just saying one of the eight has to be empty. So now if um, we look at such a case when, when, when this is not true, so if a split system is not weakly compatible, then we can visualize that um, like here, the blue is left versus right, black is top versus bottom, and uh, red is inside versus outside the cycle. So then if um, this condition over there is violated, so all of these four sets are non-empty, we get, um, like here, W is in A1 because it's uh, in the top, A2 because it's on the left, and A3 because it's in inside. That's why A1 intersected A2 intersected A3 is non-empty. And the other one are um, X, Y, Z. They are just in the corresponding intersections. So what we see here is if a split system is not weakly compatible, then we will find four elements for which we get um, all three possible splits into uh, two pairs. Like here, the circle gives us W, Z versus X, Y. Um, the black line gives us WX versus YZ, and the blue line gives us WY versus XZ. So that is all three possible ways to split um, four elements into two pairs. And if you have that, then it is not um, weakly compatible. And that is actually equivalent. So it's another way to define weakly compatible split systems. Um, Um, well, then you get another condition. In the end, if you, if you consider these as, um, so, A1, B1, A2, B2, A3, B3, those three splits together, um, all possible A choices are the corners of some three-dimensional cube. And this um, um, condition says that for one of the two parts of that cube, it has to be empty, and then by, by changing names, it's also the other. Parts. So you must have something empty in each of the um, two parts of, um, yeah, of the bipartition of that um, cube. So that's, um, that's how to look at it, yeah. So y of course this has to be true for every choice of which one is A1, A2, A3, but in the end it's just two conditions. Okay, so that is weakly compatible split systems, and, and that... Um, um, as I say here, it's an alternative um, definition. A collection of splits is weakly compatible if there are no four taxa such that you get all three possible splits into of four taxa into um, two pairs. Okay, so that's um, our alternative um, kind of split system, which is slightly more general than compatible. Um, so. Why should you look at special classes of split systems at all? Why not just allow everything? There are good reasons for that because we have some, usually you will have some limited amount of data 
And um, so you cannot um, consistently reconstruct every possible split system. So if you have n taxa, then there are 2 to the n minus 1 minus 1 possible splits. And every, every one of them might occur or not. So that dimension of this space is exponential in n. On the other hand, a common way to construct phylogenetic trees and even networks is to first calculate some distance, some dissimilarity between every two taxa, and that's only n choose two numbers. So you cannot uh, expect to reconstruct anything bigger than n choose two um, splits. Um, if you have weakly compatible split systems, they can contain up to this number of splits, so you can't expect anything more than this if you go via distances. So that's why this is somehow very um, useful class of split systems just in between compatible and, and general. Um, and there is indeed one nice um, algorithm that can construct um, phylogenetic or weakly compatible split system from distant da distance data. It's this one from 1998. This um, publication I list here is actually the one for the implementation. So there is some software available where you can run it. Um, the algorithm came about from some paper from uh, by Bandit and Dress, um, where they where they have where they develop this split decomposition theory in a quite long paper where they um, uh, they show several things for for distances. For example, they they characterize all um, five point metrics as a byproduct of this de decomposition theory. So it's it's very interesting. Um, paper with a lot of small side results. Um, so how can we um, compute splits from uh, and weakly compatible split systems from um, distance data? So we just um, look at the sums of the two distances um, like in this case i, j, k, l are four taxa that you pick. You look at the sum of the distance between i and j plus the distance from k and l. And those two, you can think of um, a tree, oh, maybe some, some white chalk. So if you have just a tree on four taxa, then you have i, j, k, l. You see that um, the distances between i and j plus the distance between k and l is short because you only get the length of all the pending edges. But if you take any other one, i k plus j l, you get all the pending edges plus two times the interior edge. So that means if, if um, the distance data really corresponds to a tree, you would have um, one short sum of distances and two strictly bigger ones if um, this, the length of this edge is bigger than zero. So if you have that, then um, you're interested in the length of this edge. And so what you have is actually that this is strictly shorter than both others. So if the distance that you have doesn't really correspond to a tree, but to something similar to a tree, then you can um, write down the distance in, in this way. So um, this is uh, isometric embedding of, the, uh, of a four-point distance that exists for every four-point metric. And so if you take this, then you have i, j, k, l would be um, the four pending edges plus two times the length of this edge then i k plus j l would be the four pending edges plus two times the length of this edge. And finally, if you take the distance from i to l plus the distance from j to k, you get every pending edge plus twice this edge plus twice this edge. So that means the sum of the distances, um, there is something that, uh, between the diagonals here, the diagonal taxa, is bigger than the two others. And that means somehow that the quartet JK versus IL is the worst according to um, 
to the distance function that you have. So you would say Rij maybe like there is this split here that supports um, that quartet and Ik versus Jl maybe there is this uh, split here supporting that quarter but Il versus Jk rather not. And so now you call some split a D split if for all the quartets that display that split, you take two from the one side, two from the other side, you have that the corresponding quarter is never, never gives you the biggest of the two sums, the uh, biggest sum of the two distances. So that seems to be a very safe approach because if the quartet you observe is not the best one, maybe it's second best and then it's still in there. So now if you need some rates for your splits, you just take the minimum over the difference between um, the biggest of the two sums of distances minus the one that you observe for the actual split and take that again th um, through all the um, choices, two from the one side of the split, two from the other side. Now this number is called the isolation index and it becomes the weight of the splits. So this is kind of a beautiful definition because on the one hand uh, you seem to get many splits because you never, you, if it's the quartet is best, it's in there. If it's second best, it's also there. Only if it's the worst, the split will disappear. Um, and this is, at least in theory, this is a very nice algorithm and actually it's also um, in practice used a lot. Uh, let's not go into the computation of this in detail. I can just say it's, it's not obvious if you just see the definition, but it can be calculated in, in polynomial time. Um, and it has some nice uh, properties. As you saw from now, it's a very canonical thing. You have no tie-breaking and no um, order dependence. And you can compute arbitrary weakly compatible split systems, meaning if the true structure you have is a weakly compatible split system, that will define you some quartet weights and then if you feed those quartet weights or some distances, if you feed them back to the split decomposition, it will return the correct um, weakly compatible split system. So that's also something that has to be proved, it's not trivial. Um, what happens in practice, it picks up only strong splits because in, with biological data it tends to be noisy so it often happens that even for good splits, you will find four taxa where the quartet that you need actually is the worst one and then the whole split disappears. And unfortunately for some data, um, it's two splits according to the biologists they would like to see more. So we have to replace this very conservative method by something where you don't take minimum over everything but rather some kind of averaging to see uh, get a good overview over your signals. Okay, um, and, and so it would be nice to have some heuristic version of this split decomposition where you um, tend to get just more splits, where the split doesn't, uh, is not uh, thrown out just because one of the quartets is the worst, but if most of them are very strong and then there are a few weak ones, you still want to keep it. In fact, such a method has not been um, developed. And um, I know that people tried, but um, has not really worked. And instead, what there exists is some, um, now again, some more special class than weakly compatible, something in between compatible and weakly compatible. It's the so-called circular split systems. So a split system is circular if for every split. So you can um, put the taxa on, on some cycle of, of length n, if n is a number of taxa, such that every split um, gives is um, one cyclic interval versus the complement of the cycle. Um, it, it's easy to see that such a split system has to be weakly compatible because for four taxa, if you just take a, b, c, d, then b and c, if they go together, then to make it a cyclic interval that contains both, either A or D also have to be in that interval, meaning you can never observe the quartet B, C versus A, D. And that's for all the four taxa the case, so circular means um, weakly compatible. And, and now 
here's some, some kind of easier structure because um, here you know this cycle is um, basically corresponds to, to a permutation of the taxa and it's somehow much easier to deal with than with weakly compatible. So here are some, some properties um, that are good for practice actually. Um, if you have a circular split system, you can draw them in a nice uh, phylogenetic network, meaning that you have no crossings and all the taxa in the outer face. And one special case, if, you, if the split, true split system actually is a compatible one, um, then it's also circular. So if your data just gives rise to a tree, then every method that can construct circular split systems should reconstruct their tree and not a complicated network. Um, there is a, a method from 2004 um, that does construct circular split systems in, in a heuristic way and that's done in two steps. First we construct a cyclic ordering of the taxa by trying to arrange them on the cycle such that closely related taxa are close together on the cycle. Then you have n choose two options to um, to choose um, a split, you just cut two of the edges of the cycle that defines you a split. And for all of these, you use some non-negative least square to calculate um, split weights and then you get, get this method. So this is actually the most widely used method to construct phylogenetic networks in practice. Um, so that somehow shows that these split systems are not just for combinatorics for playing around with, with set systems, they are really uh, relevant for uh, phylogenetic analysis. Um, so this is the split thread, I already, already said it. And um, NeighborNet as well as um, uh, split decomposition are part of this split tree software and it's available for everybody and, and um, um, yeah, as I said, used frequently actually. Uh, I, in my title, I mentioned quartets. I basically already said what they are. They are um, splits of four taxa into two pairs. They correspond to trees and four taxa on uh, resolved trees. Um, so for four, for A, B, C, D, you can, A can either go together with B or with C or with D. There are these three options. In a tree, you could also have the unresolved uh, variant that you have a star tree and then you have none of the three quartets. And sometimes quartets are the smallest building blocks of, um, of split systems because in biology you assume that every taxon is of course closest to itself and it's separated by something from everything else. So you will always have all the so-called trivial splits, one taxon against all the others. So they are not really the interesting ones. You want at least two in every part and then if you, if you um, want to build up big splits from smaller partial splits, then a quartet is somehow the smallest unit of information and that's what makes them quite useful for tree and also for network analysis. So um, once you already have your phylogenetic network, it's very easy to see what the um, appropriate weight for a quartet would be. You just take the sum of all the splits that do separate AB versus CD. So in this case, there would be this split because here we separate AB to one half and CD to the other plus the weight of this split. So the length of this edge plus the length of this edge would be the weight of the quartet AB versus CD. And then, um, so once you have the networks, it's easy to get quartet weights, but um, what you want is you want to get some real data, then you want to get some quartet weights from that data and then you want to reconstruct um, the phylogenetic network such that the quartet weights that the um, network you produce are similar to your input weights and that is some task that I addressed in, uh, with, my, with my colleagues in um, some methods that we published in 2007. It's basically the um, quartet equivalent of NeighborNet. It takes as an input weights for all possible quartets, it should be non-negative, and then we find a weighted cyclic split system such that the induced quartet weights are as close to the input weights as possible. 
So um, the algorithm proceeds in two steps. First, we want to find a cyclic ordering, um, and therefore a quartet is in a cyclic is displayed by a cyclic ordering if there is any potential split that would display it. And then we want to maximize um, the weight of the quartets of that are displayed by the cyclic ordering that we produce. And um, like here, ABCD is um, displayed by this split, so it's also displayed by that cyclic ordering. So um, just very quick overview of how we produce that cyclic ordering. We use some, um, we construct a cycle as a graph in very small steps. We start with, um, we start with uh, em no edges in the graph. The vertices are the taxa that we're interested in. And then we um, start adding edges. So in general, the general situation that we are in is we have a collection of paths and we want to locally, uh, so we want to reduce the number of paths by just adding in edges. And you can do that by every, in every iteration, you choose one end vertex of one of the paths um, and then you continue doing that until you have only one long path connecting everything and then you connect the two ends and you have one cycle. That's of course very easy uh, way to get a cycle in very small steps. And then of course you have to decide which vertices you have to um, uh, connect in every step. Um, I don't want to go into the details of this algorithm now. Um, after this, we will we just do the same as neighbor net. We use some non-negative least squares to, um, uh, to compute weights for all possible splits that are still there. So then we have some proof of consistency of this method saying that if the input quartet weights correspond to a weighted circular split system, then we will reconstruct it correctly. It's actually something where you think, of course, you want that. If you don't have that, then, then uh, what's the point? Um, but to show that this is really the case, it was not um, so easy. So, so we had to, uh, to write an extra paper just for this um, proof of consistency. This is um, just some example to show you that um, um, we have used it. <laughs> So here you see some uh, example data set. It's some Salmonella bacteria. Uh, you see that both splits have the property that there is uh, both um, networks that there is one big split here, which is contradicted by very many small ones. You see that feature in both networks, and and um, biology behind it is that there is some uh, recombination um, going on. And having these networks, you can. Um, select some taxa and then you can look at the sequences again find that recombination so that's the use of this kind of method and you see that the two methods um, get produce actually very similar networks somehow we could argue that they're different enough to to um, to try out both but the the tendency is um, the, the networks the neighbor net and the qnet they look very similar so somehow this is done and, and it looks kind of okay, at least biologists do use neighbor net a lot, but what's left somehow is um, this gap somehow. Split decomposition is more conservative, um, but it can construct um, a bigger class of split systems. And neighbor net has to restrict to circular um, split systems, and the question is why is it so hard to, um, to get some similar uh, algorithm as neighbor net for um, weakly compatible and um, that was the basis of the uh, um, um, mathematical questions that we then ask in this context so how many quartets um, by definition a weakly compatible split system displays at most two quartets per four set and um, Quartets? No. Uh, <laughs> the number of all quartets is not at most n choose two, so that's a typo. The number of all quartets is that they are displayed by a weakly compatible split system, and then of course n choose four is the number of four sets. You might have up to two every time, so it should be two times n choose four. And uh, that's somehow best possible, and you can see that um, for maximal circular split system, you get this number. 
And um, so if this is the case for all maximal weakly compatible split systems, that's what we wanted to know. Um, maximal weakly compatible means the split system is weakly compatible, but whenever you add another split, then it loses loses that property. Um, and when we looked at this question the first time, we thought it would be correct. Um, and it also corresponds to the case that in trees, every tree that cannot be resolved any further will display one quartet per four taxa, so you have n choose four quartets. For every circular one, you get this two times n choose four, and we thought that would always be the case, but it turned out it's not. Actually, just the opposite is right. For n at least seven, only circular split systems display exactly two, qu two quartets for every four taxa. So everything else, there are two sporadic ones for five and six taxa, uh, but after that, only the circular ones have so many. And, and even more strange, there are maximal weakly compatible split systems displaying less than n to the four, or of n to the four quartets. Indeed, we produced an example here with only n to the 3.5. And that is somehow a good explanation why, um, why there is no heuristic way, or it has not been discovered, to um, produce weakly compatible, general weakly compatible split systems um, in any way, from distance data or whatever, or from quartets, because somehow there is a bias. Some weakly compatible split systems have an advantage compared to others. Because you, you just look at your quartets and um, such split systems that display very many quartets have an advantage compared to those ones that display only a few quartets. So that is the uh, explanation here. But it also somehow it encouraged us to look at this question further. We had an example, n to the 3.5. So the question was how, how um, small can this exponent of n become? I mean, n to the 3.5 doesn't look so um, far away from 4. But so could it be even smaller? So um, we look for, um, uh, so we decide, uh, we, we um, define alpha n to be the smallest number such that there is a maximum weakly compatible split system for n taxa, and then we look at this um, expression here, the logarithm of those quartets divided by the logarithm of number of taxa, so meaning what is, um, and then we look at the Linus infimum of this um, fraction, meaning we look for the smallest n such that you can find um, split systems with O of n to the alpha um, quartets. And um, in that, from this first publication we wrote in 2009, we have this alpha must be between 2 and 3.5. And so the lower bound is trivial, as every non-trivial split displays at least n minus 2 choose 2 quartets. So every, whenever you have some um, non-trivial split, you already have a quadratic number of quartets. Um, so of course, this was not really um, a satisfying um, lower bound. So one thing we wanted to do definitely to, to improve the, the lower bound. So there is yet one more class of split system that I want to introduce. It's two compatible. And the split system is called two compatible if it does not contain three pairwise not compatible splits. And um, two compatible is another subclass of weakly compatible, and our examples for weakly compatible split systems with few quartets, they're all two compatible. So um, the only difference is actually, um, if you have a split system like this, then um, for each two of them, they're non-compatible, so it's three uh, pairwise not compatible splits, so this split system would be not too compatible, but it is weakly compatible um, because it's circular. So this is basically the only um, um, forbidden configuration for too compatible that is allowed for weakly compatible. So in that sense, they are kind of, kind of similar. So this is um, just an extra class of split systems. And, and the first um, lower bound we got, 
that was clearly better than two was actually then for two compatible rather than for weakly compatible split systems. So um, I introduced this alpha before as a parameter for a weakly compatible split system. And so we do the same thing for two compatible split system. I write weakly. Um, <laughs> I wrote weakly probably a copy and paste error. But I meant for beta we wanted to use for um, two compatible split systems. So we can ask the corresponding problem, of course. And that's why it's beta and not alpha. And actually we can prove 3 is at most beta is at most 3.25, so quite a small range left. Um, the 3.25 is um, um, also, again, maximal weakly compatible, so it also is in improved upper bound for the other parameter alpha. Um, further, having refined our proof slightly, we now know that 3 is also a lower bound for alpha. So our method somehow um, makes both ranges quite small. Okay, so now it becomes really um, combinatorial or graph theoretical because to construct our maximal weakly compatible split systems, we use some graphs with some special properties. So we just start with some loopless graph which might have multiple edges, parallel edges. So then we can get a split system on the edges of that graph by just taking all the splits, um, every edge incident with a fixed vertex versus all the other edges. So I call E, V, the set of all edges that are incident with some vertex V. And then um, this, um, the split system we get here is easy to, to, be see, to, to see that that is too compatible if G is, if the graph is triangle free. Because if you have a triangle, then of course you get um, three pairwise not compatible splits. So we have this, but we do not have that it's maximal at this point. We could still add something. Um, but it somehow indicates that we can get some interesting split systems from graphs. Can I yep. You just start with some graph, and then the split system is so the, the what used to be x. Okay. Um, so this x should be e actually. I, I usually I said uh, I call it the base set of the elements for which we uh, have splits. I call that x. But in this special case, so it's a split system on E, so the splits are all edges incident. The E is a set of edges of the graph? Yes, right. So we just have bipartition of the edge set into the neighbors of a given vertex and everything that is not neighbor of a given vertex. That's very canonically defined by a graph. Um, so the elements of the, the, the finite set for which we have bipartitions are the edges of the graph, not the vertices. And then somehow trivial to have this, um, this lemma down there. Okay. So um, um, now I'm, I'm explaining you how we get the lower bound three. Um, so we just, so it doesn't really uh, have any connection with the graph yet. Um, so we just start with any, with any two compatible split system. And now we go from split system to set system, something that you commonly do. Just for every um, split, you take the set that has less than half of the taxa in there. If it's a tie, you can just take both, but it's not relevant for us because any really balanced split, half versus half, would already give you um, one, uh, well, it's something in order of n to the four quartets. So we, we will not have that for, for the split systems that we are interested in. Um, so we get this set system and out of these out of the set, set systems, we take all the inclusion maximal sets. So that's some way to get, um, yeah, um, 
a collection of sets that are all incomparable in, um, with, the, with the inclusion relation. And um, then we can prove that because of the maximality, every x is contained in at least one set um, of these maximal ones. That's very easy because um, if there would be none, you can at least add the trivial split. Um, but the second one is more interesting. There is at most one x such that the singleton containing only x is in our collection B. And, and that's also easy to see because if there would be two such singletons, x and y, you can show that you can just add x, y versus everything else to the split system and then x, y would be in, in B rather than x and y. So that's you have only one. And then um, this um, implies that there are at least n minus one half pairs x, y that are contained in some element of B because one is, it mo is maybe only in the um, singleton but then the other n minus one must be contained in at least one pair, so you get n minus one half pairs that are contained somewhere. And then we can count the quartet and it's already enough. So I take nb to be the number of pairs that are contained in at least one set in b. And then we have um, the number of quartets. So we take um, n minus one half, that's the number of pairs that we have, um, in our set collection B, all the sets have at most half of all elements, so we get n half here at least, and then we can choose two of them, and we get that many quartets that have any of the pairs here on the other side. But of course we can get um, every quartet up to two times if um, each of the two halves of the quartet is once the chosen pair and once it's in the rest. So we have to take um, half of that, but even that is um, n to the 3 over 32 minus something of um, quadratic cardinality. So that shows that you will always get at least some cubic number of quartets. So this is kind of easy, um, but still quite a big <laughs> improvement compared to the n square that we had before. Uh, for the other, for the upper bounds, we use this um, graph definition again. So we call a graph three distance closed if it is triangle three and for all two different vertices there is a path of length three between them. This is um, quite, a f quite a strict um, condition meaning that passes of length three might lead you to every other vertex um, so it implies <coughs> diameter three at most three, diameter at most three neighboring vertices must also contain a parcel of length 3, so there must be every edge is contained in one four cycle and vertices of degree 2 are in a cycle or in a path of length 3, so every path of length 2 is contained in some five cycle. So it's a rather strong condition, but such graphs actually do exist and we use them to get our example of um, split systems. Um, so we have, if we have started our construction with a distance three distance closed graph, then um, we get the two compatible split system sigma and we are allowed, uh, we, we add other splits until it's maximal two compatible. Then all the other splits we are allowed to add are um, of one of the two kinds here. Either it's a subset of um, a set that's already in there, so we, we refine our split, or it's the, we take the union of several vertices and we take the union of all the edges uh, incident to one of the vertices in the set and include that split. So in terms of counting the quartets, the first count, the first kind of new splits will not change the order of magnitude of number of quartets we have but the ones here, they might increase it a lot. And so we must somehow find a way to, to rule out this situation here. And what we do is we um, have one more requirement to the graph. So if a three distance closed graph uh, has additional property um, that it uh, 
does not contain an independent vertex set except for the neighborhood of some vertex. Meaning, we have a collection of vertices. If we take them out, um, we get more than one component. But still, we don't have just one vertex in one component and the others anywhere else. So, if a graph has this property in addition, then um, this bad situation that gives us many new quartets cannot occur. Um, and then indeed we get that the quartets in the big maximal split system is at most um, number of edges choose two. And remember, the number of edges is really um, uh, number of edges is really the, the um, set for which we have bipartitions um, times the sum over the degree choose two for all the vertices in our graph. And that will give us um, the upper bound. So, how do we do that? We construct d-regular three-distance closed graphs with n vertices such that every independent vertex cut is the neighborhood of a vertex and the degree is um, O of the third root of n. So then we can do our counting. We get the number of quartets is um, at most um, all the edges choose two, that is the complement of our, our neighborhood of vertices. Um, times um, number of choices two edges from the neighborhood uh, from, uh, that are both incident with a given vertex. We sum that up. So since it's regular, this is always um, basically d square. We know that um, the number of edges is basically um, d square the num is d times the number of vertices so altogether we get um, one quarter e square and d square and um, since e is n times d we get um, n to the 13 over 3 and um, the cardinality of the edge set is of course since it's um, n to the one third regular we get something n to the four third so the quartet set, the cardinality of the quartet set is the order of magnitude of the edge set to the 13 over 4. And that is um, indeed the upper bounds that I proposed. It's already a little late, but I would like to at least give you an impression how our graphs look like. Um, so we need the following properties. It should be three distance closed, but... Um, um, three distance closed meaning um, for every two vertices there is a path of length three, there are no triangles. Um, yeah, that's three distance closed. And, and the degree should be um, basically the third root of the number of vertices. So, um, yeah, let's do this here. We take Z for fixed number T, that has to be uh, large enough. We take ZT meaning um, the set 0 to t minus 1 times that t times that t so that's where the n to the 3 comes in of course and times z5 and um, so altogether we have 5 times um, t to the 3 vertices and this t to the 3 can be interpreted as a, as a 3 tuple, tuple. And so if you have, um, this is our um, Z5, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. We start with one, uh, or we look at one um, point here. So this would be um, X, Y, Z, 0. And the neighbors of these vertices um, we are allowed to um, vary one of the three components here. So the hemming distance between this word and the other word should be exactly one. And at the same time, we move by one 
in this, uh, on this five cycle to the, so we take a plus one or a minus one modulo um, five. So we would get some, something like x, y, z prime um, four or minus one as an example. So you vary one of the um, letters, leave the other two constant, and you go, uh, you move by one on the, on the five cycle. So this is already very good to um, reach many other um, vertices with, with the three paths. The main problem is um, you can, with, with the path of length three, you will never get to any vertex that has um, the same fourth component. So for that, we introduce another um, kind of edges. So um, you say that a vertex x, y, z, 0, or x, y, z, um, a is also adjacent whenever we leave, uh, no, whenever we put the, uh, we add the same number to all three components here, modulo t, so we have x plus um, i, y plus i, z plus i, and we go, we, um, go two steps forward on the five cycle, either plus two or minus two. So this is also um, another kind of edge. And then you can see that um, whenever you want to have x, y, z, zero to some x prime, y prime, z prime, zero, you can go plus two and choose the i such that you get one of the three components right, and then you get two steps back and um, get the second and the third component here right. But since you had to change um, all three here, you will not end up at the same point that you started with. And this is somehow the, the, um, the remaining situation to get a path of length three between the points. Whenever it's not in the same, um, whenever the fourth component is not the same, then you, you see it quite easily how to, how to get it. So this is um, a sketch of the proof that this graph is actually um, three closed. Of course, the degree is um, linear in T. So we get um, the uh, third root of number of vertices. And it leaves the problem to show that uh, there is no independent set, independent cut set that is not just the neighborhood of some of the vertices. And there we apply some more general lemma where we show that um, by definition you see that this is a Cayley graph. And we show that every Cayley graph that is three distance closed cannot have this kind of um, independent vertex cut. So that's another lemma that we need for this. And then we get um, the result that um, we really get this bound 13 over 4. So now it's already after, after 5. Thank you.